So, Dad, one of the benefits or one of the things I've always loved about our relationship is how you constantly and sort of consistently bring up your past experiences and how they can inform a lot of the decision making you make day to day in the business. Uh, I'd love it if, if you could walk the audience through some of your challenges. What do you think the biggest challenge you faced in real estate development was? I think overall, um, the biggest challenge that I've always faced, as you know, is capital. As the more we grow our business, the more we need capital. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I'd say that would be one of the just overriding challenges that we've overcome and met each time. But uh, I'd say that's one of them. I think in terms of business deals, the most challenging um, would have been the deal um, that I was working on when you were a toddler. Um, and that was uh, the leases to relocate government tenants um, off of a site in Washington, D.C. to make way for the uh, Verizon Center or Capital One Center where the Washington Wizards currently play but are leaving um, after th almost 30 years. Absolutely. And, and that deal centered mm -hmm. around a relationship, right? We talk a lot about how real estate is the intersection of politics and economics. And when you think of what that nexus point is, uh, it's relationships, both relationships to capital and relationships to municipal policymakers, mm -hmm. allowing that capital to be deployed. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how relationships have impacted our ability to grow and scale? Yes. In fact, there's a lot of different lessons in that deal. In fact, um, over lunch today, we were talking about politics and about when people can make a decision on whether to keep their word or not based on friendship or fear. And uh, in that instance, um, in Washington, D.C., my mentor became mayor again. I had one and was working on the deal prior to um, him coming back into office with the uh, previous mayor, um, and Sharon Pratt Kelly. And Barry came in to, um, and then had to finish the deal, which was to build this arena um, for the Wizards. And at the same hand, they had to move government workers into other office buildings. And so we had a couple of office buildings as partners um, that we had bought very attractively so we could undercut everybody in the market, which we did. And we were 58 million less expensive than our nearest competitor. However, because my mentor was making the decision, he made a decision that it was more politically expedient for him not to do my deal ultimately, as opposed to doing it. And when I was surprised, disappointed and hurt that he would um, make that decision, especially given that it was in the government's best interest to do our deal. But I also learned about how someone who is a friend or mentor can make the decision and decide when they're going to keep their word to you when they're not, when they're going to treat you fairly or when they're not. And he pro I probably should have approached it differently, maybe had him fear um, a retaliation of some sort from me mm -hmm. um, as, uh, as a consequence, and then maybe he would have thought twice about it. Absolutely. And, and you have a quote that I really love from one of my favorite statesmen. Henry Kissinger said, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. What advice would you give to younger entrepreneurs who are navigating political waters adjacent to their projects and endeavors? Well, I think when you're doing business, you're doing business. You're not building a, a marriage. You're not you know, bonding with a relative or friend. You're doing business. And so you can do business with people you personally may not like or disagree with. Um, so, and then also just because somebody is an ally politically in one instance, the next day, like, you know, Barry, for example, was not an ally later. So he was not a permanent friend. Um, you are a permanent friend and I am a permanent friend to you, but we're bonded by something far greater. Um, but people in politics, um, you know, are not bonded like that. And so, um, you know, I think we as business people have to also practice that same theory. No permanent friends, no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. So that means that we do business with Republicans, Democrats, and independents, and everybody else. Um, and uh, so we're here to do business. And I think that's, um, you know, an approach we have to do and understand that we can do business with people that we necessarily don't like. Absolutely. And, and keeping on that concept of building relationships, Talk about external relationships, relationships with politicians, relationships with capital providers. But so many entrepreneurs, especially those early on, have to think about internal relationships, relationships with their partners, with their co-founders, with groups that are a bit larger that can help with the balance sheet. 
And a lot of them are much more like you and not like me. And they don't have a partner that taught them the business that loves them. So uh, walk me through how you think uh, a younger entrepreneur should focus or should think about partnerships within their business. Well, I think the first thing is that as a young entrepreneur, they should, I think, do a lot of what I did, which is to self-teach myself. So I was always interested in new knowledge and learning. So I read an awful lot about the real estate business, about finance and anything kind of related to our business from either a financial or development or design or tenant perspective. But also I tried to build relationships with people who were much more experienced than me. And so, for example, in my 20s, in my mid 20s, my best friends were 40 plus years old um, and they had a wife and kids. And one of them was had a wife and kids and was divorced. And, uh, and then my mentors were in their late 60s, early 70s and had from, you know, long careers in real estate. And so I learned a lot from them. And so I took the time when we're socializing or going out for drinks or having dinner or lunch to learn from them and, uh, and to gain knowledge because I believe that there's no substitute for experience. And what I can give you is a benefit of my experience. And so you don't have to repeat the same mistakes I did. Well, I didn't have someone in my family who had done this. And so I had to learn from other people who were friends and I learned from their mistakes and I learned from, you know, their successes and how to do that. And, uh, and so I think it's very important as you build relationships to surround yourself with people who are going to be, you know, accomplished and who've done things and who are, you know, like minded in terms of drive that you have. Absolutely. You know, and you hear this almost overused because you're the average of the five people you spend most time with, right? Or birds of a feather flock together. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you're thinking about building those relationships, uh, how are you identifying those who you want to surround yourself with, those who you want to learn from? I think there are a lot of people out there, particularly in the social media landscape, that talk a big game. How do we know who has the substance to back it up? I think that you have to look, first of all, I think you want to look for people who are like-minded in terms of drive and who are where you want to be or in an area or have accomplished something that you want to be. But I think that one of the things that's very important is to look at what someone's accomplished. Look how long they've you know, um, been accomplishing and being successful in the space that they're in. I think the thing that we see on social media is people are more entertainers as opposed to actual knowledgeable professionals who've had experience in real estate or any other industry. And so I think it's important to vet people that you're going to get knowledge from. And a big part of that is what have they done? How'd they get there? Um, you know, um, and look, I think, you know, the people that I surrounded myself with, they had started off, most of them self-made and had started off, um, you know, um, with one small building or one parking lot and then built it up to something really special. I mean, one of my mentors, um, you know, started off poor, got the contract for one federal government parking lot to manage and then built that, that company into the largest parking management um, company in Washington, D.C. metro area and became Washington, D.C.'s largest property owner. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so and, and we should get more into that topic in a little bit. But one of the things you talk to me a lot, and I think it's a great place to end, is about value. We've talked about building relationships. We've talked about an insatiable hunger for knowledge and technical mastery of the craft. But outside of those two things, if you had to impart somebody watching with a value that's essential for them to be a successful entrepreneur, what would it be? Integrity. I think that we have to operate with a, a, a compass of honor. Um, we have to, and what I mean by that is to do things the right way, to not look for shortcuts. You can look to accelerate, but not look for shortcuts, to treat people fairly, to keep your word, to expect others to do the same thing, um, and to try to do the best that you possibly can and to operate on that basis. And uh, I think if you do that, then that gives you the opportunity to build relationships. And because people will do business with you again and again, if you are, you know, operating with out integrity, trying to get the better of your partner or the like, then you'll have a you know one trick pony, and you'll get to do it one time, and then they'll do business with somebody else in the future. We touched a little bit on a story of one of your mentors. Uh, I think it's, uh, in fact, I'll let you tell it. Uh, 
the three gentlemen who bought the hotel in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Uh, do you mind giving us the Reader's Digest version of that? Absolutely. So my a great example of the American dream are that there's a story of three men who were early in their days in Washington, D.C., and they met at the Mayflower Hotel. One of them was a parking lot attendant. The other one was a janitor. And the third one was a busboy. Well, fast forward 30 years later, the janitor owned the largest waste management firm in the Washington, D.C. metro area. The parking lot attendant had built the largest parking management company in Washington, D.C. and became Washington, D.C.'s largest property owner. And the busboy owned over a dozen hotels and two dozen or so restaurants around the Washington, D.C. region and internationally. And the three of them started a bank to make loans to entrepreneurs. And the three of them bought the Mayflower Hotel. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an incredible story. And I'm actually going to be a little divisive here. Uh, those gentlemen were incredibly smart, incredibly driven, uh, but they also didn't back down. They were ready to fight. And I think certain circumstances in business, you have to be willing to stand your ground. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people think that that can run counter to investing in and building relationships. How do you know when it's the right time to fight and when it's the right time to make amends? Well, I think if you operate with integrity, part of that is that you expect the other side to do the same thing. And then if they don't, then you have to hold them accountable. I mean, because you're protecting your interests, your investors and your lenders' interests as well, and you have a responsibility to all of them to make sure that their rights are protected and their opportunity is enhanced and protected. And so if someone is breaching their agreement, then you cannot turn a blind eye on it. And sometimes people look at conflict as something that is you know, detrimental or negative to someone who's seeking to enforce their rights. And in the end of the day, we do have to enforce our rights. And we are a country of laws. And so sometimes you enforce those rights through litigation. And there's no other alternative. We don't take, you know, 10, we turn our back, take 10, pace, take 10 paces, and then turn around and shoot each other. We have to solve our business problems in court today. And, uh, and so we have to be prepared to do that when necessary. Absolutely. And as you navigate some of the challenges that are unique to the market today. Uh, and we think about opportunities where cities have to now go and fight uh, to reclaim vacant office space, uh, to revitalize decrepit or underutilized housing, to fill holes in their municipal balance sheets. They've got a set of challenges that I think differ from the private sector. Would love to hear a little bit more about what you think the greatest threat facing urban America today. Well, I mean, that's a very good question. I think the, the biggest threat that faces urban America is a change of how people live and work now. Technology has changed it. Cities like New York, Chicago, DC, Atlanta, and so forth were employment centers. And those employment centers had everybody gathering together to work collectively, to utilize common facilities and common equipment and computer systems and the like. And so in order to take advantage and work efficiently, you needed to work in a facility. And so as a result of that, it stimulated all kinds of economic de uh, development, economic growth, service providers, restaurants, and the like. And then also people wanted to live closer to where they work to avoid the increasing traffic and, and so on. Now things have changed. People are working remotely more frequently and more often than not throughout the major cities now, people work at least a hybrid. And as a result, that has changed the dynamics of these cities tremendously so. And as a result, cities that were meant to accommodate two to three million commuters each day no longer have anywhere close to that, maybe 10 to 15 percent of that per day. And they have to reinvent themselves. And the governments are going to have to take a leadership role in reinventing themselves. And that's going to be that they have to make themselves more attractive for people to come and live in. And, uh, and not just for the sake of convenience, but for the sake of quality of life. And that's going to be a tough ask. I mean, places like Miami, look at where we are at Miami Beach, a wonderful place to live and a wonderful place to work. But in New York, it's freezing right now and people are cold and they're indoors and it's kind of dark. Absolutely. And you can see the net migration from low quality of life, high tax states down to high quality of life, low tax states. And those high tax, low quality of life, uh, states are a little bit more challenged. 
uh, but a wise man, I think it's you, uh, said that every setback is an opportunity in disguise. So from a real estate perspective, understanding the challenges that these cities face, talk about the opportunities. I think the opportunities are to build better, to make reinvent themselves. I think from a businessman, a business person's perspective, for us, um, one of the opportunities is to buy assets that are no longer viable. So for example, office buildings in many of these cities, especially class B and C buildings, are no longer viable anymore. And so some of those are gonna be ripe for conversion into residential or hospitality uses. And on those, there's the opportunity to buy low and to be able to build something and, and reposition a building and convert it to something more competitive. I think we're gonna see much more of that. I think also that because of what's happening in the marketplace, um, people are looking at places very differently in terms of where they wanna live. And so there's an opportunity to provide now buildings that are going to address the current demands and needs of you know, the residents who wanna be in them now, which is very different than what they were before. Mm -hmm. And that, that's incredibly interesting. I'd love to actually go a little bit deeper. Uh, so as a consequence of a change in work habits and the you know, advent of hybrid work and work from home, there's been a meaningful reprice in the office sector. Now, obviously that's hurt office building owners, but very, very interestingly, it's also hurt office building lenders who've had this mantra of extend and pretend that's lasted since the advent of the pandemic, and now the chickens are coming home to roost. So when you think of regional bank balance sheets and real estate lending balance sheets, uh, how concerned are you with commercial property loan risk? Very. I think that right now what's going to happen is we're, I mean, not just commercial office buildings, but apartment buildings where they were built or acquired at cap rates of 4% or less. And now cap rates are 6.5% or so because interest rates have moved so significantly. Interest rates at one point were, you know, 3% and now they're 7.5%, 8%. And so that has had a devastating impact on these buildings, on apartment buildings, because they can't service that increased debt and the cost of debt. And, and those are being held mainly by regional and local uh, banks. The office buildings have a double whammy, the increase in interest rates, and then occupancies at you know 40% of what it was at best before COVID. And so they, they are both dealing with fundamental issues and short-term issues of cost of capital. Those two things are gonna make the office building market so weak and have that banks are gonna have major losses. You're seeing it now. Um, last year, you had Signature Bank having issues. You had a few other banks out west having an issue. Now, Community Bank of New York is having an issue. And you'll see more and more this year of the uh, regional and local banks having significant issues um, with their exposure to commercial real estate. And within the next three years, over $3 trillion of that debt has, it will be coming due and payable, and they will all be in default. Absolutely. And the challenges with those regional and local banks, those solvency issues, are leading to a consolidation in the lending environment. Their signature, First Republic, are getting swallowed up by larger institutions. How does that impact real estate lending, particularly on the opportunistic side? Are you getting the same terms from a JP Morgan Chase that you would from an Eagle Bank? No, and in fact, what's happening is it's, it's drying up capital um, for um, investors and developers um, to you know, and small businesses because these regional banks have such heavy exposure to commercial res, um, real estate that they can't make additional loans. But there's the opportunity, private credit. Private credit was functioning um, and very active um, during the last market run when things were going well and interest rates were lower because it was, they were more efficient. You could do MES and senior from one lender. They were not subject to the restrictive regulations that banks were um, subject to. And so private credit was playing an important role. Now they are expanding even more and there's gonna be greater opportunity for experienced real estate investors and lenders to step in to private credit and provide more capital to projects and to buildings and assets that are worthwhile and that are good solid investments, but because of the dysfunction in the marketplace and the stress in the marketplace, credit is not readily available from the typical institutional lenders. And so you'll see private credit play a much more important role. And I think that runs you know, through, um, you know, the rest of this decade and even more. And I think private credit is here to stay in a, in a very meaningful way. Interestingly, um, I was talking to Michael Milken. Um, at a, we had a roundtable um, late last year, and he was saying private credit 
was going to be the future, not just in real estate, but in, in commercial lending overall. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Yeah, and I want to play devil's advocate for a little bit. Right, so large scale commercial lenders and FDIC insured banks have now been regulated out of the construction lending and high volatility commercial real estate lending space. And that chasm has been filled with debt funds and private credit lenders. Does that lead to increased volatility within the real estate market? Uh, is that going to create another bubble? Has it created one already? No, I don't think so because actually the private credit lenders are more knowledgeable they are more accountable because more often than not, their financial um, well-being is predicated upon them doing this well and making good decisions. They have a vested financial interest in the outcome as opposed to an employee of a bank who's only worried about their job and maybe some form of a bonus. They're generally not shareholders and they're certainly not shareholders in that particular real estate. So private credit will be more disciplined they will make better decisions and they will be able to see the opportunities. And also they're not allowing um, you know, borrowers to lever up with so high. So private credit is going to take advantage of um, the opportunity that's gonna to continue to grow because the regulated banks are gonna make less and less loans. And for example, the Eagle Banks of the world, the super regionals and the local banks, they don't have a credit card business like JP Morgan does or a consumer lending business or a small business lending business platform at the level that a JP Morgan does or auto loans that can offset the losses in commercial real estate. These banks lose their money in commercial real estate. They'll be out of business and taken over by a larger bank or closed, or they'll be out of the lending business, which many of them are now. Private credit will be the beneficiary of that opportunity. Got it. So let's take ourselves out of this technical rabbit hole. I think it's a fascinating discussion, but I want to bring it back home to our listeners and our watchers. You're an entrepreneur. You're starting your business, uh, likely in real estate. Uh, you're going out to get your first bank loan on a meaningful real estate development project. What are your do's and don'ts? What are your advice to that guy? Well, I think, I mean, your first real estate loan means, I mean, it should be like any other loan. You want to make sure that the project is well thought out, that you look at the upside, but you've got to look at all the risk. You've got to look at this from a lending perspective and what the risks are and have a mitigation plan for those risks. Mm -hmm. And then to look at what the reasonable leverage is and, the, and then the source of repayment. And hopefully there's multiple sources, refinancing, sale of the asset, or stabilizing of the asset, or, or bringing in a JV partner. But having multiple exits is important. But also being able to convince the lender with evidence that you have the ability to execute. So more often than not, if it's your first deal, Unless you are coming from being employed by a developer or a real estate investor, you would need to bring in a partner, like I did. So my first building, um, it was a 100,000 square foot office building. I had never built a house before, yet alone an office building. So I knew that my limitation there was I didn't have experience. So I brought in developers, mid-sized development group that were three partners that came in and they brought the experience in to develop the building, I had the deal and the structure. And so we formed a joint venture 50-50. They put up the money and the experience, and I had the deal, got the deal done. Got it. All right, so I get this question all the time. People jump into my DMs and they say, Donnie, what should I invest in? Should I do real estate development? Should I look at value add? What about stabilized properties that give me reoccurring income? What do you say? Where's the best opportunity? I think it depends on what your objective is, what's your investment objective. So if your investment objective is to build a nice retirement nest egg, then you're, bet you're investing in long-term income producing properties. So rental properties or retail properties that you can rent out. And then over the long time, you're gonna pay down the debt and you're gonna get equity appreciation. Um, if you're looking to um, build wealth and do it quicker, then it's gotta be opportunistic. So you've gotta buy under distressed circumstances where the assets are penalized, um, the market factors have made them um, less attractive and that you're buying them from a lender or someone under significant distress that is compelled to sell. And, uh, or you need to develop. Um, those are the opportunistic spaces and that's where you can create more rapid wealth 
Um, and then there's another pathway is that is to build a portfolio of income producing multifamily um, apartments or go into affordable housing like the company that you've been building, Legacy, where you are um, able to build affordable housing and with essentially almost no money out of your pocket if you can cover the pre-development dollars. So if you cover the pre-development dollars, then once you finance a project and start construction, you can cash out by and large and use you know, subsidies and low-income housing tax credits and the like to finance it. And then recycle your pre-development dollars into another deal and then begin to build a portfolio of affordable housing that will produce um, fees for you. And then, as you know, of course, long-term value at the end of their affordability life. And so that's another area to go into. Absolutely. And it takes everything in me not to orient us to a deep dive on affordable housing and spend the next two hours talking about tax credits and depreciable basis. But I want to make sure we're delivering value to our watchers. Mm -hmm. uh, when somebody's tuning in, in large part, they're tuning in because of your story, uh, starting from very little and, and building an empire that, that we can literally see behind us. Uh, folks ask me, and they really should be asking you, how do you get started in this business? I mean, it's only, basically, you just start. You got to look for a deal. Again, once you decide what your objective is, then you need to hunt for the deal that is compatible for your objective. And also, it's important to learn the business. So I'm, I quit college after my freshman year. I was going in, into college. I went to, pre, went to college for pre-med and not business. So I didn't learn anything in college on the one year I was there that could help me in business. So I had to curate my education. I took some classes at colleges and took some classes from real estate organizations so I could learn valuation and learn commercial basics of commercial real estate investment, but learning self-teaching yourself. And with that knowledge base and go out and look for an opportunity um, that kind of fits your goals and to pick one that's bite-sized that, you know, it's hard to get done, but doable. And, and then to get that deal done. And then once you get that deal done, then the next step is pretty obvious in front of you. You look to do another one. Um, and then it depends again on what your um, investment um, you know, focus is, is it to uh, produce income? Is it to produce long-term, you know, financial security or is it to build, um, long-term generational wealth? And they all have different, you know, steps. Absolutely. And I think you said three things there. The first one was technical mastery. Mm -hmm. Understand what it is you want to do and understand that endeavor intimately. The second thing is relationships and the term you use, you didn't use it here, but you use it all the time. Be in the mix. I think that's important. You got to see deal flow. You have to have the appropriate relationships to not only identify the opportunities, but action them. And, and the last piece you talked about is know your risk. Understand how much risk tolerance you have, what risks you can take and are responsible, and what risks aren't. So I want to talk about a risk that you mentioned earlier on in that answer. You mentioned dropping out of college at 19. Now, a lot of folks' parents, including you and mom, would be very upset with somebody dropping out of college at 19. But let me ask you, in 2023 today, to our young audience, is there value in going to a four-year educational institution? There can be. I mean, I think if I had, I consider that almost a luxury. Um, and if I had the ability to do that back then, maybe I would have. Um, but I had also, my experience was very different. Um, I had worked since I was um, 16 full-time at the United States Congress and you know, worked a full-time job. And so me going back to school and not working just really wasn't, you know, it was boring. And that was a part of it. Uh, but yeah, there is value. I think it helps you with critical thinking. I help, it helps you build relationships, especially depending on where you go to school and what you study, you can build relationships that can be you know, valuable to you later on in life. But the experience of learning to be a good critical thinker is always helpful. Absolutely. And, and we center around these same sort of characteristics, the ability to solve problems collectively under duress, the ability to create, maintain, and, and ultimately utilize relationships to achieve discrete objectives. Uh, and we talk about integrity. But when you look at a potential entrepreneur, if you could say, this is the single characteristic that can be the greatest predictor of success, which of the three would it be? I would say, 
the ability to sell is very important to sell your dream, sell your idea, sell your vision. Um, someone who's a student of their business, and that's an ongoing process. You don't have to know the whole thing and, you know, and master it when you do your first deal, but you've got to be a continual learner every morning, every day to learn about the business. And then finally, um, you've got to have a tremendous amount of drive. And, uh, and I would ask the fourth thing. I think you've got to have the ability to operate under significant stress and to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think, um, I mean, I think that's one of the hardest things to do is to be able to manage the stress. I think a lot of people are, um, you know, are capable, um, technically, of being great entrepreneurs. Um, they're smart. They know, you know, the business well, but they don't have the appetite for the risk and they can't take the stress and the pressure. And if you're not able to be comfortable being uncomfortable, then it'll wear on you and you won't be, it'll paralyze you and you won't be able to make decisions. That is my favorite topic, distress tolerance. Mm -hmm. It's my position that the outcome of your life is highly correlated with the ability of uncertainty and distress that you're able to tolerate in pursuit of what you hope to accomplish. Absolutely full stop, the greatest predictor of success. You do that exceptionally well, obviously. Talk to us a little bit about how you manage stress and what habits you developed or had intrinsically uh, that have been helpful in that regard. Well, I mean, look, I learned as a kid, I mean, my, it was my mother and I, by and large, my mother was the head of our household. My parents were divorced when I was five. So neither of my parents had a lot of money. My mother was an entrepreneur, so she was up and down. So as I became more aware of that, of course, it was stressful to me as well to understand that we had, she had financial responsibilities to pay rent and things of that nature. So, you know, I learned to live and, you know, continue to go to school and to pursue some personal interests and to pursue sports and athletics. Um, and, you know, while, you know, also having that happen. But as I went on in business, I mean, I really kind of made the decision that I wasn't going to get married and have kids until I was at a place where I could do that financially comfortable. So I was able to take greater risk very early on because it was only me suffering the consequences. And so, but ultimately I realized what we do. We're in business. We are pursuing business to build, say, this building. Okay, it's concrete and bricks and glass and, so, and steel, but it doesn't live. It's not really relevant other than it's providing a place of shelter for human beings. So what I do is not that consequential. And, um, and then what I have to lose is not really that consequential. It's money. It's a man-made product. It is a currency for humans to trade in. And, uh, and so there's more of it being produced every second, um, more of it being accumulated every second. And so I figure that I'll figure that part out. Um, and I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not on the battlefield, you know, with the responsibility of men and women under my command that their lives depend on it or that our country's security depends on it. Um, we're just out here trying to make some money. And so while that's, you know, relevant and important, I want to do it well, um, there's no debtor's prison mm -hmm. and I'm not going to die if I fail. That's right. That's right. You know, it's that perspective is refreshing. I don't think that there's a real estate developer in this country, and certainly not one at your level, that's ever said, what I do isn't really that important. But I think it's, it's that perspective that allows you to take the risk and to make the objective decisions uh, in times where deals like this one, the Bath Club, hang in the balance. Can you take us back to a particular moment in your career where a deal hung in the balance and you had to utilize that habit to create the outcome that you wanted? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that almost every deal that I did of any con the bigger deals for us at the time, all required me to almost put everything at risk, to double down. I mean, one of the things I, I again, I say I learned from other people, Sheldon Edelson, who became the richest man in the world, richest person in the world, um, said he doubled down. Was Atlanta, was it was uh, Las Vegas Sands, he just doubled down build one hotel casino, leverage it up, and build another one. And, um, and what that is, is a kind of a mindset. And so 
So me being comfortable being uncomfortable allowed me to take much greater risk. So 2100 was extremely important. And when the Washington Post came after me because the sore loser of that deal um, sent them after me saying that I was a protege of Mary and Barry, it was extremely stressful because it was consequential to me as my first deal. I'm trying to build a business and build a reputation. And now I've got one the newspaper that brought down Richard Nixon coming after me. Um, so I had to realize again, it's only a deal. And if it's not this one, I'll do another one, but I want to win this one. And what's happening to me is unfair, but so be it. This is the arena I'm in. And so I'm going to operate and I'm going to be successful. And so I combated it and, and figured it out by, you know, making sure that I had alternative, um, you know, messaging. But at the end of the day, I had to get smarter on PR and I had to get smarter on how to deal with the media. And uh, I realized also that there won't, wasn't going to be any fan club for me. And so the fan club would be me, my family, and ultimately my wife um, and, and, and my, my, my family. But that, you know, again, what I'm doing is trying to get ahead, build a business. I think it's much more important, like the building we're in now, it's not what it is. The fact that we did this with almost 30% minority and women-owned business contracting. And so we gave people opportunities, economic opportunities, who didn't have them before. That's what is relevant about this business. And so I try to have a higher purpose other than building buildings for rich people or, you know, successful companies or the government or whatever. I actually take more personal satisfaction and pride out of what you're doing with affordable housing yeah. by providing housing, high quality housing to people who don't have it. When we walk through um, you, the uh, building you did at 17 Mississippi Avenue after your ribbon cutting, I was so impressed that the apartments were nice and they were nicer than the apartments I lived in when I was in my early 20s. I said, wow, you're providing a building that's providing people at the lowest income level a high quality place to live so that they can hopefully now spend some more of their energy and time on improving their life's position and being able to start, you know, building income for themselves and making a better life for themselves. And that's actually much more important and much more impactful than this building, which is 10 times bigger. Um, and I think that people get all hung up in this country about wealth. And so, hey, it's a big deal to build luxury condos that are millions and millions of dollars, like here from what, six million to $30 million or something, um, that that is somehow more important than providing homes for the lowest income level. And as a now 63 year old, I realized that the most important contribution is Mississippi Avenue, which you did. So Mississippi Avenue is more impactful than this building. That's, that's very nice. There's a pushback in our country right now by some that um, diversity, and equity and inclusion is not important or somehow it results in an inferior product product that couldn't be further from the truth all aspects of it first of all we have to recognize in this country that this country has a history of extreme oppression so from the fact that this country was built on 249 years of slavery which provided industries that were uneconomical to actually exist and help us in terms of our agricultural business and other businesses that would not have been profitable except for slavery and to build a nation which slaves built the White House, for example. And so to say that 249 years of slavery and then 100 years of extreme oppression and segregation somehow um, should just be forgotten and that everybody starting off at the same place is just unreasonable and unrealistic and you know, defies logic. Um, and, and then you can think about, you know, well, how do we write that? Because it's not for somebody to have three, a 350 year deficit in terms of being able to have develop generational skills and knowledge, um, you know, is, is not fair. And so we as a nation that we want to get to be a more perfect nation have to take steps to do something about that. And this is a capitalistic democracy, uh, pillars of our democracy rest on capitalism. And in order for our democracy to endure, capitalism has to be fair and successful. And capitalism can't be fair 
under the circumstances where we don't bring everybody in to our opportunities and, and success. And so um, businesses have a role. And I think it's recognized that there have been these wrongs and it takes steps to aggressive steps to level the playing field. And we have to know that women have been oppressed by our society um, and placed in um, limited roles, um, important ones being a mother and, and, and the like, but not provided equal access to the foundational, uh, educational foundation and the like to pursue dreams and goals and business and entrepreneurship and education and so forth as men have. So when we recognize that those things have happened and this is a part of our country, then we have to do something about it. So we at our company, as you know, practice affirmative development. And the goal there is that we, and the, and, the, and, the, and the definition of that is really we take aggressive, affirmative steps to provide broad career and economic opportunities to minorities, mainly African Americans and Native Americans and women. And the way we do that is we just look at talent and look for talent with a wider lens instead of a myopic lens. Most businesses, most entrepreneurs are focused on efficiency and efficiency breeds favoritism and efficiency makes a more myopic lens. We look at a wide lens and then we try to make that efficient. And so this building that we're in now is considered one of the best built buildings, one of the best design buildings and one of the best you know, um, value um, the buildings in the marketplace here. The architect was a, a, as a Latino architect. The developer is an African American developer, and the construction company had over thirty percent of its subcontractors to be minority-owned businesses. So that being said, shows you can build greatness with inclusion, and that diversity makes us all better and makes us have a better product. And it'll save democracy. And right now, democracy is being challenged and, and, and questioned um, because there's a perception that our capitalistic system is unfair and inequitable and has left a lot of people behind and forgotten others. And therefore, we're seeing now the risk of an unfair, inequitable system, and therefore, we've got to change it. And, and you talk a lot about the economic incentives. You say talent is distributed equally, but opportunity isn't, and as a consequence, there is a significant economic incentive to allocating capital where opportunity has historically overlooked it. Now, what I'd love to do is end on a fun question. I want you to treat it like live TV, 30 okay. seconds. But are great entrepreneurs born, or are they made? They're made, without question. Um, my, my parents were, my mother was entrepreneur, my father was somewhat entrepreneurial as an auto mechanic, um, but I taught myself to be an entrepreneur. I uh, educated myself to be a real estate entrepreneur, and I developed the skills over time to get better at it. And so we all have the ability to become successful entrepreneurs if we have some of these fundamental skill sets like the appetite for risk, the ability to be comfortable being uncomfortable, and the willingness to be students of our business and to work really hard. And if we have those skill sets, um, there's no limitation to what we can accomplish in business. Not going to be easy. won't be easy for anybody. If you're a woman or a person of color, it'll be more difficult. But expect that and embrace that too and let that be a motivator as opposed to a detriment or a discouragement.